Shalom, brothers and sisters. This week, Christine and I and our family, we were traveling. We got back from Missouri late this week, so I'm going to do a combined Thursday thought slash Sabbath message. And I know it's a late Thursday thought, but all week I've been pondering this, and I think that it makes both a good thought and a good message. In First Moses, from the Plates of Brass, we have an extended story of Noah. Starting in chapter 10, in verse 4 it says, And it came to pass that the Lord said to Methuselah, Thy daughter and the daughters of thy sons have sold themselves. And behold, mine anger is kindled against the children of mankind, for they will not hearken to my voice. And it came to pass that Methuselah and Lamech and Noah went forth prophesying and taught the things of Elohim even as it was in the beginning. And Yuvah said unto Noah, My spirit shall not always strive with mankind, for these shall know that all flesh must die. And I will give unto mankind my teshuva, and in this they might ascend to the 120th degree. And if mankind doth accept this teshuva, I will wash them clean in the waters of my mercy, one degree at a time, but they shall be clean from the first degree. But if they do not accept my teshuva, I will send my waters as floods upon them. So here we have a prophecy of the flood. Now, I want to state, you know, I, I am a Mormon Kabbalist. And so for me, this flood, I, I want to be very clear that I'm not sure that the flood literally happened. Okay. I believe that the flood referred to here is washing away my carnal and wicked desires as I'm born again in Jesus Christ. The desires inside of me from Adam and Eve all the way up until Noah and his wife, they are trying to convert my wicked desires. And here the Lord just is going to purge them. That's what we're going to talk about today. At the same time, I also realize that there's a number of people that see this as something that literally happened. There literally was a flood and God just straight up murders the majority of the population of the earth, which just sounds horrible. How wicked are people, or were people at that time, I should say, that the Lord felt this need to kill everyone and everything. And, and that's one of the reasons why, to me, it makes more sense that it's referring to our desires. But I like this idea that the mercy comes to wash away sin, our sinful desires, or drown out and destroy our wicked desires. So it has a dual purpose. If we're righteous, it's going to be good. If we're wicked, it's going to be bad. Now I'm going to skip ahead to verse 14. And here, Methuselah and Lamech have grown old. And so now Noah is called to preach unto the children of man this Teshuvah. Teshuvah, by the way, is a Hebrew word. We generally translate it as repentance, but it actually means return. This idea of returning back to the path of God. And I love this idea because it implies that there wasn't necessarily an original sin that we're all condemned by. But rather, from the very beginning, we were with God. And we may stray, but the Lord wants us to come back. So Noah's teaching these people, the, the wicked generations, or our wicked desires, the things of God. And they say to him, Behold, we are the sons of Elohim. We are the sons of God, or the sons of the gods. Look upon us and see, for have we not taken unto ourselves the daughters of men, marrying into this covenant? So they're saying that because they married righteous desires, if we're talking about ourselves, or because they married a woman, that they married women that were a part of the covenant, they are now a part of the covenant too. And then they try to give their evidence. Look upon us and see, are we not alive in the flesh, eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage and living upon the very breath of the Creator? So in other words, look at all the good things that we're blessed with. Look at all the nice things that we have. And look, see that our wives bear unto us children. The same are mighty men, which are like unto them of old, men of great renown. So again, look at our prosperity. This is that prosperity gospel. As long as things are going good, everything must be okay, right? Not necessarily. And so they wouldn't listen to Noah. They called him a fool and they used as it says here, the vain things of this world to show as signs one to another that he was a false prophet. And then it adds that those that had the covenant and left it 
didn't keep their garments clean, but wiped the filth of their hands upon them. And then that specifically says it's referring to the daughters of Noah, saying he is touched. Now, in Kabbalah, there's this idea that in the scriptures, everything male represents the desire to bestow, either in righteousness or in wickedness, and that the female is the desire to receive. And so this is saying that these daughters of Noah, which were originally righteous desires, have been converted to wicked desires. They want to receive in wickedness rather than in righteousness. And obviously, these sons of men merely want to give the vain things of this world. And so this is placating egoism. Now, if we skip over to chapter 11, we see that Lamech and his wife pass away and Methuselah also passes away. So now it's just Noah and his kids. So at this point, you can probably guess what's going to happen. He's going to build the ark. And it says in chapter 11, verse 6, Behold, the earth was corrupt before Elohim, and it was filled with maliciousness. And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the land. Now, this idea that every single person became wicked in the world I mean, maybe it could be true. I just personally have a hard time believing this. And so that's, again, why I feel like this is referring to our desires. When we come to Christ, we can backslide. We start off as Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden, and we partake of the fruit and wickedness. We repent, and we start working our way in Teshuvah as Israel on the path of God. But our past selves, our past desires are still there. And so even though we've been born again, there are temptations. And the Lord wants to purge us of these temptations. And so he's going to wash us clean, wash our desires clean with the waters of his mercy. It says in verse 16, And lo, I, even I am, shall advance upon thee in a flood of water, upon the land to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that liveth on the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, even as I have sworn unto thy father Enoch, that of thy posterity shall come all nations. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and the wives of thy sons with thee. And then it goes into what to bring into the ark. So God isn't destroying everything. He wants us to keep all the righteous desires in this, in this box, in this ark, that's going to float upon the waters of his mercy. And these are the generations Noah and his kids and their spouses, those desires to give and receive. But then the other animals and plants and things, those are our lesser desires. Those are desires that are righteous desires, but they're not as complex. They're not as complicated. The way the Kabbalah sees it is when the dry land comes out of the ground in the creation story and grass first appears, those are our initial desires. And as they grow, then they become more complex as the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And then they become more complex as the animals that live upon the land. And eventually they become so complex that they become Adam and Eve. And these, because it's the creation of God, are the righteous desires dwelling within us. Think about the first time you came to God, whether it was through reading the Book of Mormon or attending church, and you suddenly had this, this desire in your heart, like, I want to know who God is. That's the grass peeking up from the land that just came out of the waters. And as you grow that desire, then that desire to know God and know more about God becomes the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, because you want to learn and know more. That desire grows and becomes more complex. And it eventually grows until it becomes Adam and Eve. And then from there, you're not, you're perfected in Christ, but you're not perfect on your own. And so, therefore, you begin growing in grace through the various generations of Adam and Eve recorded in scriptures. That's the story of us. And at this point, we're ready for baptism. We're at Noah. That's where we're at in this. Now, we're going to skip ahead to verse 32, where it says, And it came to pass that after seven days, the waters of the flood were upon the earth, and all the fountains of the great abyss broke open, and the veil between the earth and the heavens was rent apart. And the waters were upon the lands 40 days and 40 nights. Now, what does this mean? If you want to look at it from a more realistic, literal perspective, 
I don't know if this is realistic, but a more literal perspective. Then it's saying that after rain for seven days, yeah, you're it's, it's starting to flood. It's starting to back up, right? And when you're reading in Hebrew and you see things like 40 days and 40 nights, that basically just means a very long time. It's not a literal 40 days and 40 nights. But this idea of the great abyss breaking open and the veil between the heaven and the earth being rent apart, this is us being spiritually born again. We're not trapped solely in this finite creation anymore. We can now know the will of the heavens. With this veil rent and the heavens open, this is the Lord's prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We now have access to know God in a personal and real way. And that veil is rent so that we can know what the Lord wants from us. And this, of course, allows the light of Christ to escape from us, to flood the earth with his light, transforming the creation. Now, I want to back up for a second because I missed a part and this is important. Verse 31 says, And they went into Noah, they being everything that's supposed to be on the ark, and Yavah, the Lord, shut them in. Now, this is important to understand because Noah didn't close the door. Noah doesn't have control over the ark. Noah built the ark and is, well, based on the designs the Lord gave him, he and his sons, and he allowed the Lord to decide when they entered and the Lord shut the door and he's not steering. Noah is not steering this ark. It's completely under the control of God. He has no say here. So now, back to verse 34, And the children of man assembled together, even the daughters of Noah and Naima, I'm not really sure exactly how to pronounce that, and their husbands came with them. And these came unto Noah to the ark. And they called to Noah, saying, Open thy doors for us, that we may come into thee in the ark, that we shall not die. Well, it's a little bit late now. Noah and his father and grandfather preached to them for how long? But now that something bad is finally happening, they're waking up. This prosperity gospel isn't true. It's a false gospel. Something bad is happening to them. And so they know, oh, I, I did something wrong. But they weren't able to realize it when things were going good for them. But Noah didn't close the door. So because of that, Noah can't open the door either. Now, looking at this as our desires, it's pretty easy to see that Noah would be able to speak with a voice to be heard over the thunders and the rains and answering them. Looking at this from a literal perspective, that this literally happened, then I would have to surmise that the Lord would have amplified Noah's voice because he would have to speak through the ark, through the rains, through the thunderings, through all this noise for them to hear him. Here's what he said. Have you not all rebelled against the Lord? And have you not reveled in your sins, saying, Look upon us and see, are we not alive in the flesh, eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage, living upon the very breath of the Creator? And thus I say unto you now that the Lord has not brought upon you this evil to destroy and cut you off from the face of the earth, but you have brought it upon yourselves. Now, here's where I get into my Thursday thought. As a Sabbath message, this is very simple. We need to purge our egoism. We need to move forward in Christ and allow his mercy to wash away any of our sinful desires, right? But there's a problem here in my mind with this idea that says, you have brought this upon yourselves. This spits in the face of King Benjamin. King Benjamin says, and this is in Messiah chapter 2, verse 30 in the RAV, which would be the RLDS or Community of Christ chapter and verse, or 417 in the OPV, which would be the Salt Lake City Churches, the Orson Pratt chapter and verse. Perhaps thou shalt say, the man has brought upon himself this misery. Therefore, I will stay my hand and will not give unto him of my food, nor impart unto him of my substance, that he may not suffer for his punishments are just. But I say unto you, O man, whosoever doeth this, the same shall have great cause to repent. And except he repenteth of that which he hath done, he perish forever and has no interest in the kingdom of God. For behold, are we not all beggars? Do we not all depend upon the same being, even God, for the substance which we have? 
for both food and raiment, for gold and silver, for all the riches we have of every kind. And behold, even at this time, you have been calling upon his name and begging for remission for your sins. And has he suffered that you have begged in vain? No, he has poured out his spirit upon you and has caused that your heart should be lifted with joy and caused that your mouths should be stopped, that you could not find utterance. So exceedingly great was your joy. And now if God, who has created you, on whom you are dependent for your lives and for all that you have and are, does grant unto you whatsoever you ask that is right, in faith believing that you shall receive, oh then, how had ye ought to impart of the substance that you have one to another. So how do we reconcile these two ideas? We have Noah saying, you have brought this upon yourselves. And yet at the same time, you have King Benjamin saying, how dare you think this way? Now, it's very easy to say, well, you know, Noah preached these people forever. They called him crazy and all these, all this, that, and the other thing. Of course, he's going to be angry. So of course, he's going to say this. I think there's a big difference between us reaching out to someone who is homeless or someone who is impoverished or someone who is suffering and saying, hey, let me lift you up. And a global calamity, even if it is something inside of ourselves or whether it's literal, I want to tell you right now that if it is within my power, if I am on an airplane, a boat, a car, what have you, and there's some sort of apocalyptic event happening and I can open the door and I can save people, I will. And that's why I believe that this must be our desires and not literal people, because maybe there was enough room on the ark, but our God is a God of miracles. And so therefore, if he would have known they were going to repent, he would have had Noah and his sons build the ark larger. Maybe there wasn't enough food. doesn't matter. Our God is a God of miracles. And so therefore, he could have fed them by making more food, by multiplying the food, as we saw Jesus do in the New Testament with the loaves and the fishes. I think this has to be our desires because our desires, when they don't really change, they pretend to change in an emergency. Uh oh, everything's going bad. I better do this thing this way to get what I need. I will pretend to repent so I can get what I need. Then once the flood's over, once everything's okay, then I can go back to my wickedness. I can go back to my egoism. We must wash these desires away, brothers and sisters. They must be utterly destroyed from the face of the earth. And by the earth, I mean our bodies. Because these wicked desires dim the light of Christ that shines through us. Look at Christians. I'm, I'm going to just go ahead and call somebody out here. And I'm sorry if I offend anybody. But let's look at the West, what is it, the Westero Baptist Church. When they show up at funerals, protesting, talking about everybody's going to go to hell. How does that help the Christian cause? How does it help the Christian message? It, it doesn't. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to go and wipe those people off the face of the earth. But if we turn that inward and make those our desires, some of our desires are not good. They are the Westro Baptist Church, if you will, inside of us. They are our prejudices and they must be washed clean. I don't want people to read this and think, well, I can forget what King Benjamin said. If something bad happens to somebody, it's on them. I want to look at this the way that Jesus looks at things. When he was asked, is this person cursed because of something he did in a past life or something his parents did because he was born blind? The answer was neither. He was born like this so that I could heal him. And brothers and sisters, I want to testify to you that that is my belief. When you see someone in need, they're there so that you can help them. The Lord put them there in your path so that you can do what you can to heal them. Now, if you try to offer someone food and they say, no, I don't want your food. I don't want your money. Then at that point, you're doing everything you can. And that's when we fall into this camp of Noah. That's when we fall into this idea that you have brought it upon yourself. 
I'm standing here with food and you refuse to eat. I'm standing here with water and you refuse to drink. I'm offering you money and you won't take it. Once all of your efforts are exhausted, there is nothing else that you can do. When Jesus went to heal that blind man, that blind man could have said, no, thank you. I I want to remain blind. We have that free agency. But you know what? That doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't offer the blessing. That doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't put that foot forward to allow for the opportunity. And in this story, whether you want to see it as our desires or a literal group of people, and whether that's global or local, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, Noah said, here, take everything. Let's go build this ark. Let's survive. Let's live. And they said, no, thank you. You offer me food, but I don't want to eat it. You offer me drink, and I don't want to drink it. Because they're happy where they are. And so therefore, these desires get washed away in the flood of the mercy of God. Because they were content where they were. So what's my, what's my thought here? What's my message here for you? Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, when we beg the Lord for help, is he going to say, you have brought this upon yourself? Or is he going to say, be washed clean in my mercy? And, and it's not based on your living circumstances. It's not based on how much money you have or how big your house is or how many cars you have. It's based on your heart. So that's my thought for you. If this flood is your desires, where is your heart? Which parts of your desires are being destroyed in the flood and which ones are floating away safely, sealed up by the Lord in the ark? And I'm going to call it as it is. This is an ark of the covenant. No, this isn't the ark that was built in Moses' time to rest in a tabernacle or sit in a temple. But it's still an ark of the covenant of our hearts that allows us to survive the flood of the mercy of God. So that's my thought and my message for you this week. And I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.